Welcome everyone to today's panel discussion, post-disruption defense, how to safeguard healthcare operations in the era of cyber attacks. I'm Brian Zimmerman with Beckers, and today I have the pleasure of serving as moderator for this session. On behalf of Beckers, thank you so much for joining us. So before we get going here, I'm just gonna walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. If at any time you have trouble with your audio or video, please try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box. We've got folks on the back end who are available to help out there. And with that, let's go ahead and meet our panelists. I'm going to tap on each of these gentlemen here to share a bit about their professional background, organization, and the like, just to, so everyone can really appreciate their perspectives today as we move through the conversation. Michael, let's start with you. Awesome. Hey, Brian. Great to see you. Thanks for having us on. Uh, Mike Peluso, Chief Product and Strategy Officer at Rectangle Health. Uh, I've been with the organization 11 years now. 10 of those years, I was the Chief Technology Officer, uh, building out products and platforms specific to the dental and healthcare industry. Uh, prior to that, Brian, I spent a lot of time in the healthcare claim payment space, specifically um, at Cigna Healthcare and sp specifically at two other software companies. Michael, I appreciate the background. Thank you so much. Uh, next, Brian, I'll turn it over to you, not to, to be controversial right here at the start, but I appreciate that you spell your name correctly with the I. So, uh, but nice to meet you. Let, let's let's meet you for the audience. Well, yeah. So, <laughs> yes, I do. I spell it with the I, but Brian Kaleo, I'm the director of Dykema's DSO industry group. I've been in the dental space 29 years. We're uh, one of the leading law firms in the dental space. So we represent over 750 dental organizations, all 50 states, six Canadian provinces, Europe, Japan, and Australia. And um, really, really happy to be here. This is a really important issue. Thank you for having me. It is, and I'm looking forward to getting your perspective as well as we move through the conversation today. Gary, let's meet you. Hey, I'm Gary Salvin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Blacktown Security. I've been in the dental technology space for 30 plus years. I actually built one of the very first cloud systems back in the late 90s. Um, I had thousands of users running cloud, and that was kind of my first introduction into the cyber world. Um, I spun up Black Talent in 2017 based on you know industry needs. I was seeing a lot of practices and, and groups being hit by ransomware and they had you know limited paths to recovery. So um, Black Talon was formed and now we service about 42,000 devices worldwide in the healthcare space. Um, we focus primarily on preventative measures. So helping DSOs and groups and dental practices and medical groups prevent uh, intrusions into their environment. But we're also a full incident response company. So we get hired by law firms, um, insurance carriers, et cetera, and actually victims themselves to help recover from ransomware effects. So we'll talk a lot about that in a little while. Yeah. And, and I think Gary, appreciate that background. I think let's, let's begin with you for this first question, which is kind of sort of an, a high level assessment of, of the current cybersecurity threat landscape in healthcare. Can you just give us a, a, an assessment of that? What trends are you seeing? Obviously um, cyber risks, ransomware attacks are, are are on the rise, but what beyond that can you share with our audience today to sort of set the stage for the conversation? Yeah, look, it's been a crazy ride over the last seven years. And, you know, if you look back originally, ransom demands were a couple thousand dollars. They would hit a server or two, maybe bring the business down for a few days. Fast forward to today, uh, most ransomware events are systemic, meaning they'll hit every single server and workstation in the environment. For most DSOs, especially, I'll call it, you know, the, the small to medium uh, size organizations, you're looking at a ransom demand, usually high six figures. If you happen to be a medium to a large size DSO, you're going to be facing a ransom demand in, in the seven figures. Um, and the big problem we're seeing right now is that these events are typically bringing organizations down for a minimum of two weeks. In fact, if you look at what's been you know, publicly available with some of the larger DSOs, they've been down four or six weeks. We just did a ransomware attack um, the end of uh, 2023 for a um, medium-sized DSO, and they were actually down for almost six weeks trying to recover because of the, the, the event itself. And we're no longer up against, you know, hackers sitting at home, you know, in Florida, you know, in mom's basement, for instance, you're up against highly technical, highly organized, sometimes government oriented uh, hacking groups 
that have access to some of the most sophisticated code taking down these organizations. And then the, the biggest problem we're seeing right now, it's not just the extortion or the ransom demand, it's the theft of the patient data. And often that's systemic through the environment. And then it's you know the, the contacting of the data, you know, actually contacting patients, demanding that they reach out to the business that got hit, telling them if they don't pay, you know, they're gonna be the victim of a ransomware, excuse me, an extortion event, you know, things like that. So the theft of this data is a huge problem right now. And actually what we're starting to see, and we just talked about this recently, um, what we're starting to see is the threat actors starting to cut back on the actual um, encryption or locking of all the files in the environment. They're actually just focusing on the theft of the data because they know once they steal this patient data, the victim is most likely gonna pay. You know, look at all of the major events that have happened in the healthcare space. Almost every victim is paid. It's not the right answer, but that's just how it works. You know, the scary thing, Brian, for me, um, with all of this is how it's evolved so quickly. I mean, it used to be a ransom problem, and that's bad. You know, somebody breaks into your system and they hold your data hostage and you have to pay a ransom to them. I mean, nobody likes that. That puts your organization down. But what we're seeing more recently, and I've spent a lot of time working with Gary and talking to him about this, is the cyber criminals these days, a lot of times will infiltrate your system and they'll remain in your system, Brian, for weeks. You know, instead of it, maybe they're refining finding their tactics. They're saying, why announce to the whole world that we've taken over your system and let you start to, you know, interact countermeasures instead? Maybe the smarter thing is to remain in your system from the perspective of the criminals. I don't endorse this, but maybe the smarter thing is to stay in your system for weeks and weeks and weeks, gather as much data as we can. If you're backed up on the cloud, which Gary and I generally are fans of, they can infiltrate the cloud. We've seen that if they stay undetected in your system and they get certain administrative passwords, then they can infiltrate your cloud backup to virtually assure that you have no option, you have no exit strategy, but to pay them. And we've seen a lot of instances where it used to be they would there'd be a skull and crossbones on day one. They infiltrated your system. You knew it happened. They say, pay us a certain amount of money in cryptocurrency and we'll let you back in. Now they can go undetected for weeks or months, gather up enormous amounts amount of data, enormous amount of patient information, personal information on the C-suite, infiltrate the, you know, the cloud backup. And by the time they make their presence known, they have the capacity to, you know, extort money and blackmail executives of some dental practices that have higher profile patients. They can get their data, contact them and do a whole host of things. And when you go to your normal playbook of, well, let's go to the backup or let's go to the cloud. By the time you do that, that's been infiltrated. So this has been really, really scary how quick the tactics have involved and just how damaging it can be. And, you know, what Gary said is that's the best case. Best case, you're back up in two to three weeks. If everything goes well, Brian, you've lost revenue for two to three weeks. If one or two things you know, don't go wrong, don't go well or something happens, you could be down for months. Yeah, and Brian... David. Go ahead, Brian Z, yeah, just just to sort of look at it from an industry perspective too. You know, we think about sort of normal peacetime, DEFCON five. I, I would say we're at DEFCON two. One's reserved for really bad bad scenarios. But it, but if we were to look at our industry and we were to look at the, the dental space and we were to look at the DSO space and the medical space, we're we're kind of at a DEFCON level two when it comes to cybersecurity and these threats. Um, and and again, Brian and, and Gary have, have really outlined it in detail, but if you were to sort of look at the overall industry, it, it's definitely not a, a normal peacetime occurrence where we're at right now. We, we really have to sort of up the vigilance and, and up our own protection capability. Well, you know, Michael, we've talked about this before. Healthcare is a target for this now because the first wave was like, you know, let's go after Chase Bank and let's go after Walmart and giant organizations and compromise data. But, you know, those organizations have really done a good job as of late of locking everything down and making it very, very difficult. Not to say they're not impervious. You do read about certain data breaches here and there at big organizations, but that's a lot of work for the cyber criminals because those organizations 
organizations have made it very, very hard. Healthcare, you know, for the most part has been, you know, behind the eight ball on this and really hasn't devoted the resources to it. So the cyber criminals see it as low hanging fruit. You know, this is virgin territory or a new, you know, frontier for us to attack that hasn't really devoted the time and resources to stop us. It's really scary. Well, th well, they know where the pot of gold is, yeah. right? And in healthcare, it's absolutely there. And, and to kind of back up this data, if you look at the internet crime report that the FBI and the Department of Justice puts out every year, in 2023, the number one targeted sector was not the banks, was not Department of Defense, you know, contractors, things like that. It was actually healthcare, right? And, and the hackers realize, hey, this is highly regulated uh, data, and they know, right? They talk in their own chat rooms or on their Telegram channels talking about, hey, I just hit a medical group, a dental group, right? They paid me, you know, within days because, you know, they knew they had regulated data. Like, this is what's going on in the background. This this is this is real right now. Um, and one of the bigger challenges we're seeing, and this is Brian's world too, is M&A, right? So these DSOs, they go and gobble up these practices and all of a sudden they're onboarding um, these, these practices and different technology stacks, different managed service providers, different ways of handling security. And all of a sudden, they're just adding all these things into their parent company and it presents more and more risk every time they, they do an acquisition. So you know, we can talk about this a little bit later, but there's, there's definitely some risk here and there's ways of mitigating that risk as well. Yeah, I, de I definitely want to get, we'll definitely get to the consolidation piece yeah, for sure. And I think you collectively sort of really painted a picture about how this has evolved, how how much of a, a, a challenge this is and, and why. I, I think maybe some commentary now would be useful in terms of how um, practices, dental practices, other healthcare organizations can really get, get ahead of this challenge. What what can be done here? And, and then we'll maybe get into some specifics around consolidation there too. But yeah. um, Gary, you want to start us off on, the, on this front, then Brian, maybe you can hook on. Yeah, I think the first thing is visibility. One of the biggest challenges I see in this space, the DSO world, is the executive teams. You know, call it C-suite, the board. They have no visibility into their risk. They're they're taking information that's passed low down on the totem pole all the way up, indicating, oh, we're secure, we're fine. They often have no data to back that up. They have actually no visibility into their their real cyber risk. They're just relying on information that's being told to them. So what's what's the big challenge here is the C-suite, the executive teams, the board, they have to have full accountability. And this starts with a very clear line that has to be drawn between IT, right, information technology and cybersecurity. One of the biggest problems that I see, Brian sees it too, is that the IT team who's keeping servers up and running, helping doctors, keeping image and equipment running, you know, fixing computers, replacing computers, you name it, they're not focused on cybersecurity, right? They maybe have a tool running in the environment that is supposed to, quote unquote, protect them from certain types of events, but they don't actually know where they have cyber risk. So there's a, um, there's a terminology that's been pretty popular over the last year or so. It's called attack surface analysis, right? What is it? It's just a fancy word for where am I going to get hit, right? Where do I have risk? Where am I going to get hit? And what am I going to do about it? You know, so there's lots of really impressive tools that cybersecurity companies can deploy now that will actually paint a very clear picture for executive teams as to where they have cyber risk so they can make appropriate business uh, decisions. Right? And the other problem that I see is a lot of DSOs, they start panicking about cyber and they just start cutting checks to you know, all these different services and, and, and products. And then they're just wasting so much money because they actually don't know where they have risk. They're literally just burning money. I tell people that all the time. Just just take that ten thousand dollars you just spent and put it in a fireplace and light it up, right? Because you're you're spending money in the in the wrong place. So, having a true picture of how to of where your risk is and how to address it, I think, is one of the the biggest challenges. And then it goes back to what I said before: is through mergers and acquisitions, which are obviously very important in this space. Um, there's no cyber due diligence being done. So they're just gobbling up these practices. They're integrating them into their IT systems. Then if one of those practices are impacted, it could spread systemically through the DSO. Um, so there has to be a lot more controls and um, uh, standing operating procedures put in place in, in order to try and minimize uh, this risk. And this is all typically done during you know, an LOI with, uh, with an acquisition. 
So I, think I mean, to put, a, those... to put a finer point on it, because, yep. you know, Gary's too professional to say this, <laughs> you know, you don't, and again, this isn't an infomercial, you don't have to use Gary, but you have to have a third party look at this, okay, period. I, I can tell you, it's my, I'm in my 29th year doing this, your regular IT staff, they just can't. And, and here's the scary thing. When I interface with the C-suite, Brian, all the time, the CEO, the CFO, the chief operating officer, they're like, you know, I talked to my IT staff. We have a monthly meeting. They said that we're all set. I mean, of course they did. I mean, it's really hard for them. You know, the IT staff, when they meet just practically, Brian, you know, in the operations meeting, how many IT people are going to go to the CEO and say, we don't got this. No, we're frightened. Like, this is a big problem. They should. I mean, you wish they would, but they're not going to say that because they run the risk. At least per their perception is, you know, we'll look like we're not competent if we say that. It's just the opposite. I think the you know, a sign of competence with an IT team is saying, hey, we got to get a third party out here to look at it because it's like if you were a shot, you know, Brian, with a, you know, some somebody shot you with a gun and you had a bullet hole in your chest, would you go to your general practitioner? You would not. You got to go to the ER. And what you have to do is you've got to make a risk assessment of the organization. And what Gary and other companies uh, do is they'll have what I call white hat hackers, people that are, they work for the good guys, but they're hackers and they're going to try to break into your system. I mean, there's no other way to say it. You're going to give them permission and sign documents. You're not going to call the police on them when they do it, but you're going to let them try to break into your system and you're going to find out really, really quickly what your vulnerabilities are. And we've seen crazy things. I mean, I've seen a casino broken into through a thermostat. Nobody remembered that the thermostat was a smart thermostat and that was a way into the system. And they got in through the thermostat and there's all sorts of other routers and things you've forgotten about that you don't even use anymore, but they have access to your network and the hackers are going to figure it out. So you know, the IT folks have to do day-to-day -day IT work, keep the system running, replace equipment, troubleshoot, you know, various routine issues that come up with, you know, things. They can't be like ER doctors that are there to assess this. And the best way, you know, if you're a C-suite person and you're looking at this and, and all the C-suite wants to do, Brian, is sleep well at night. They just want to know that this is covered. So if, you know, they don't necessarily, the CEO is not going to do a deep dive in every Every aspect of vulnerability and countermeasures, but they want to know that this is covered. And the way you get that peace of mind from a high level, if you're listening, is you get a vulnerability report from somebody. If it's not Gary, it's some other company that says, we have tried to break into your system. We've assessed your system and either it's vulnerable in these ways in which we're going to work with you to fix it, or we've tried to break into it. You know, you're doing a pretty good job and we think you're in good shape. If you have an outside report like that, then yeah, I mean, you've done everything you can do. But if you just go to regular routine meetings and your in-house IT tells you, yeah, they got this covered, you're running right. an oversized risk. Simple and, as that. And, and, and to your point too about the many sort of avenues of, of risk and to the point around consolidation, that map of, of, of potential risk areas grows as, as consolidation happens. Uh, Brian, can, can you get into that even a little bit more here? Uh, yeah. And then Mike, I want to check in with you and, and, and see if you have any thoughts too. Well, I, I, there's multi levels, right? Right. You acquire a dental practice or a group of dental practices. Now you've got to integrate them in your system, and you might be integrating new vulnerabilities that you haven't thought of. That's one thing. Okay. The second thing is you want to sell and everybody does. I mean, all the big DSOs or mid-sized DSOs want to roll up and they want to sell for a nice multiple on EBITDA. You possibly are compromising the value of your organization if you're not protected. I mean, I'll tell you, we've had several, I, I talked to Gary about this recently, several deals that were on the cusp of an equity event. Like they were about to do the equity event and they had a cyber attack. And in a couple instances, it put everything on hold. And rightfully so. I've represented a few buyers where that happened. And I said, I'm the last one that wants to interfere with your deal, but I cannot um, monetize this risk for you right now. I, I cannot like, you know, I'm looking at this situation and you're asking me to quantify what this risk is and I can't do it at this moment. And anytime you're doing diligence and you're representing the buyer, if you cannot quantify the risk at that point in time, you have to put everything on hold or cancel it and walk away or one or the other, 
either. So, you know, these are things that a lot of people, Brian, don't think about until they have an event, but the event can be devastating far beyond, obviously, the inconvenience of having your office shut down for two or three weeks or a month. I mean, that's devastating enough, but way beyond that, you might have an equity event or you're planning one and um, this could interfere with that. Or also, it's a black mark on your record. Let's say you've got Gary engaged and you have an event and Gary's able to come in and, you know, maybe fix it in a few weeks and it opens back up. You've got to disclose that when you sell the company. And now the buyer is going to have a more heightened awareness as to your cyber plan. And that could disrupt or slow down the sale. So, you know, this is one of those things. Like I said, the, the, the joke I used, it's kind of like the flesh eating virus. You know, they've got a cure for the flesh eating virus, but sometimes they've got to chop your fingers off or they got to dice things off. And we just don't know where it's going to go. And the best thing to do is not to get the flesh eating virus. And in the case of cyber protection, you can absolutely say that we have mitigation me measures, but there's no silver bullet that just stops the problem. And often, you know, under the best of circumstances, you're shut down for a period of weeks. Now it's a black mark on your record when you want to sell the company, you've got to disclose it. If you have a sale imminent or you're in a sales process, it could suspend everything or terminate it. So this is the sort of thing where, I mean, I could go on with all the reasons, right. but just in short, you really want to have this buttoned up before you start strategically looking to an equity event or there could be far ranging consequences for this. Yeah, permanent damage can be done, even yeah. if you've got good mitigation sort of placements ready to respond, still going to see some permanent damage there. Um, Michael, what, what would you add here before we move yeah, forward? Yeah, and, and, and Brian Kaleo said two really important things that I, that I want to focus on. And one of them, M&A itself draws attention to an organization. You do a press release that you're going to acquire a practice, or you do a press release that you've just acquired. That's how the, the hackers find you. That's how the bad actors find you. So, so if you think of that practice of doing M and A and doing press releases like that and doing announcements like that, or just becoming a, a bigger organization, sort of think of becoming a household name, which which is kind of what a lot of the DSOs are trying to do. That's what draws the attention of the hackers. And it and it if you are not if you don't have the company in place or you don't have the security processes in place, and like Brian said, not not just a couple of IT guys. Right, we all love IT guys, but but they're not able to handle ransomware attacks. They're not able to handle cyber threat. You got to have that in place before you turn on that M and A machine, or before you do that press release that says, "Hey, we're going to acquire more practices." You have to have those in place proactively, definitely not reactively, because again, reactively is too late. And then I think the other one that that Brian really focused on, and and we should keep it in mind with almost every question. And we talk about threats and we talk about data. Well, behind all of this, there's a revenue impact. Uh, a DSO goes down for six weeks. Well, there's there's no revenue for six weeks. Um, a press release about a, a hack goes out could affect your EV value upon an acquisition. I think when we think about sort of cybersecurity and cyber threats, definitely very important to keep data secure, but also to kind of drive that C-suite awareness, th this will... This will cost you significant money operationally, significant money when it comes to an equity event. And, and really what, what I try to do when I talk to a lot of executives as well is, is remind them data is important and we, want, we, we don't want data getting out there, but, but the revenue impact to your organization, this could easily put DSO, a, a DSO out of business if they couldn't operate for eight weeks or they couldn't. That, that's a lot of cash flow that they don't necessarily have to, to float. So there's a there's a really big importance level happening here that I just wanted to highlight for everyone. No, and one other thing that I think is really important here, so we're not beating up on IT at all, the IT department plays a critical role in this, and, and Gary and other companies collaborate with them. I mean, all we're saying is that, you know, you don't take a gunshot wound to your general practitioner, but your general practitioner is critical to your overall health, as is the IT department, and the IT department plays a critical role in collaborating, you know, with an outside um, consultant like Black Talent or another one to work with them. So we're not in any way, you know, putting them down or minimizing their importance, Brian. They're very, very important, but they play a collaboration role here. And it's just unfair and too much to ask for an IT department to do this all by themselves. 
to, to your point, the general practitioner doesn't have the the tools and everything they need to to treat a gunshot wound. And right. Gary, I want to I want I want to turn to you now, and um, I love to. So I, I think there's been a, a good comprehensive conversation here about managing internal risk and really getting that transparency. Um, but I want to move now to sort of maybe talking about third party vendors, cyber attacks associated with those and how you can minimize risks, sort of these external risks that are also exist out there. Um, Gary, I want to get your thoughts here to kick things off. Yeah, look, I think I think change healthcare changed everyone's thought process really quickly, right? All of a sudden, two thirds or, or more of the entire healthcare system was brought down, including Department of Defense, right? And and uh, I actually teach up at West Point. I remember walking up into a uh, a meeting up there and I said, oh, did you guys hear about change healthcare? And one of the officers was like, yeah, like my kid couldn't get a prescription today because they're down. So third party risk is, is huge. Um, and I think a lot of people don't put much effort into it because they think big company, Amazon web services are being used, Microsoft Azure. So, you know, all these technologies that, that these companies are using are big names. So with big names must come big security. And I think that's a huge problem right now. I'll give you a great example. We did a um, uh, ransomware attack against a dental organization. It wasn't a DSO. They serviced the, uh, the, the dental space and the financial space. And they had their data compromised on, on hundreds of um, DSOs and other groups. And I remember getting on the call with a C-suite and the CEO said straight out, he's like, I can't believe this happened. We bought the premium service from Amazon Web Services. How, how could how could Amazon get breached? We had explained to them, look, it wasn't Amazon getting breached per se. Your developers didn't build your application properly and they left the data exposed. And that's how the hackers found it. So with that being said, I think there's a lot that can and should be done from a third party risk mitigation perspective. The first is you have to do due diligence on your third parties, right? You have to understand exactly what they're doing from a security perspective. Sign a non-disclosure with them, whatever they're going to require, and then start digging in and find out, you know, what are they doing internally for security? What are they doing externally, which is even more important, kind of this, you know, as Brian's been saying, this third party assessment of your third party. So a cyber company can come in and actually do all the testing and the penetration mm -hmm. testing and the vulnerability scanning and all these other things then actually provide that data back to the third party you may want to work with and then start digging into, you know, um, their policies and procedures and other things. Look, this can take a couple of hours at a minimum just to get a very basic overview. And there's also companies that specialize in this. But, do you know, as part of being HIPAA compliant, you actually have to do this, right? You have to do cyber due diligence and on, on your third parties. And here's a really fascinating thing. Brian and I talked about this uh, last week. Um, we have a very large DSO client, hundreds of locations, and they wanted to bring this AI technology into their environment. So we get the provider of the AI technology in and we start asking them certain questions, right? And one of the things with AI is they leverage these large learning uh, models or language models, I should say. And when we started drawing a map of where all of this data would go, meaning patient data would go, all of a sudden it went not just into AWS, but into about seven other systems where patient data was contained, right? So all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, like our risk is out of control because my data is not just in one spot. It is literally all over the place. And then tack on text messaging applications and imaging software, right? And all of these other products where patient records are stored. And then you realize, wow, we got, we got a lot, we got a lot going on here. So I think it's very important you understand who has access to your data, number one, where your data is stored, two, and then three, what do they do with the data? So if the data sits in these AI engines outside of their purview, what do they do with it? Are they allowed to sell it? Are they allowed to use it to train AI on other products? And I think most DSOs right now have no clue, right? They, they just don't know what's going on with their data. And as a DSO, you can do everything right, but your third party gets breached, you still have a breach. So 
Well, it's why you got to do the risk assessment from a third party, because a lot of organizations, Brian, don't even know the right questions to ask. I mean, I see this legal day to day. I mean, that's my job. When somebody comes to me with a particular question about a DSO or a dental organization, I'm assuming many times they don't even know the right question to ask. And I got to guide them through that process. It's the same thing with, with cyber protection. They don't even know the right question to ask. And in the end of the day, it's why, you know, the car companies end up, they still use utilize these crash test dummies. I mean, you can on paper think, you know, hey, we've built this car and this car is crash resistant. But in the end of the day, you got to just send it down that runway and crash it into something and say, well, either our thesis is correct. We crashed it into here and the crash uh, test dummy is fine or we thought it was good. But when we crashed it, we didn't think of something. And, you know, it's a good thing we learned right now that, you know, there's a problem here. And it's the same thing with this. You might think you're secure or you might think you have you know, identified all your outside vendors or every, you know, uh, every component or piece of equipment that has access to the system. And then you let Gary or whoever you hire, you know, go do a mock hacking exercise to try to hack into it. And all of a sudden they say, well, no, we've, oh, oops, we forgot about that other thing. Well, we found it. And thank goodness we know right now, just like with the crash test dummies, we thought it was safe, but when we set it down the runway and crashed, we found out we didn't think of something. So now we're going to have to, you know, fix that. It's the same thing with your, with your system. You have to, you know, battle test it and figure out. And if it passes muster and that the white hat hackers try to break in and they can't, then you can get some, some measure of peace. But if they look at it and they think of things you didn't or find vulnerabilities, you have an opportunity to correct it. Look, and I, I'm Brian spot on, you know, the, the, the other thing that I see a lot of Brian is they hide behind the phrase HIPAA compliant. Right. So all of a sudden the DSO wants to engage with a company, regardless of who they are, right? That's going to have access to their data and like, oh, we're HIPAA compliant. And then I'll start digging into it or my security engineers will start digging into it. All of a sudden the wheels just instantly fall off where, where we get to the point like, how, how can you guys even make this claim? You're not even close to being HIPAA compliant. And I think it goes back to what Brian says, the DSOs, these groups, they just don't know what to ask. That's, I that's mean, HIPAA compliant means you're encrypted and, and a few other things. And that's nice. But just because you're temporarily, you know, encrypted doesn't mean you're impervious to being broken right. into. It's two different things. So you could be technically, Gary, HIPAA compliant in that, yes, we encrypt our data, but also vulnerable from a cyber protection standpoint. So somebody can break in and then unencrypt the data and go look at it. I For mean, sure. that's the issue. Yeah, because it's all paper, right? They're, they're looking at stuff on paper. We look at it from a technical perspective, very different uh, perspectives for sure. Yeah, Gary, yeah. You're, you're, your team is doing the diligence. You know, the, there's these vendors and then there's vendors of vendors. And, and like you said, it can almost go to the go to the power of eight. There's vendors of vendors of vendors of vendors. And, oh, yeah. and that's where a team like Gary has, they check that as opposed to, you know, if you're a DSO and you kind of go, oh, they're HIPAA compliant, check the box. You, you can't just check the box anymore. You also really can't claim ignorance anymore. Though those days are somewhat over. It, it's really to have somebody like Gary and team go, yeah, we checked all eight levels, all eight levels past the security we were we were looking for them to pass. So it's it's important to have that. I call it vendors of vendors checked as well. And it's also important not to claim ignorance. You'd be surprised how many providers I talk to. They go, we didn't even know we were using change. And you kind of go, how, how did you not know that? Well, our PM, we thought we were getting it from the practice management system. We didn't know that they had another vendor behind them. So it, it's definitely important to have all those boxes checked. And I think it's difficult for a DSO to do it alone as well. Definitely an organization like Gary's is is trained to to check all of those levels. It's fourth and fifth party risk. I mean, Michael, that's exactly what you just described. I mean, that's what it's coming down to. Yeah, but it's first party risk. It's it's you are <laughs> having to deal with third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth yeah. party risk, but Fair there's right. only first party risk. They're coming after you. You don't get to point the finger and say, oh, that was some other vendor. That was somebody else. It doesn't matter if they broke into you, Brian, on the seventh or eighth vendor or the ninth party risk. It's going to be first party risk between you and the government and your patients and class actions and everything else. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I guess the follow-up that I want to ask too, it just seems as this landscape continues to evolve and become more complex, it, it seems like there's a certain level of vigilance that is needed here. 
what is I, I guess uh, we we'll get some dialogue here around the cadence for for making sure you're 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 assessing risk on a regular basis. Is that important? Is there a certain cadence you would recommend? Yeah. Um, uh, Gary, any thoughts there? Yeah, look, the cadence has changed dramatically over the last couple of years. I'll, I'll paint the timeline in, in a couple of seconds. Three or four years ago, we were doing some of the testing that Brian was alluding to quarterly, right? Then we quickly realized hackers are finding these vulnerabilities. They're exploiting them in much shorter time. They're building what are called um, a hacking toolkits, which find the vulnerability, exploit it, and give the hacker access to your network. So we're like, all right, let's 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 slim that timeline down a little bit. Let's do it monthly. Fast forward to where we are today. We are now doing these tests every four hours, right? That's that's really the cadence that has to be happening. I'm not saying do a pen test every four hours because you'll be broken about two days. <laughs> but what I am saying is you have to run vulnerability scans on your computers, on your firewalls, anything internet facing, these web services every four hours. Because look back a couple of weeks ago, what, what was Google coming out with almost every day for four straight days? Google Chrome has to be updated immediately because there's what's called a zero day exploit. And if you visit a website that's infected, your computer will get hit, right? So the ability to scan these computers and look for these vulnerabilities every couple of hours and then actually patch them and create kind of help, uh, self-healing networks is really where the cyber world is at today. And I'd be willing to predict in the next year or so, this will become real time, right? Just like we have antivirus software now that's real time, we're going to have vulnerability management that's that's real time because... 40% of all cyber attacks are through vulnerability exploitation. Hackers scanning your devices, your smart devices, your firewalls, your computers, your servers, your websites, and finding these vulnerabilities and literally pulling a tool out of their toolkit and breaking it. And it sounds overly simplified, but that's actually how it works. Um, so the cadence uh, for pen testing, depending on the size of the organization, it should be done at a minimum uh, once per year. And we're starting to do it for all of our clients now twice per year. Um, and then there's external pen tests, which are tests against like your firewalls and servers, things like that. And there's internal, which basically means if I'm a hacker and I land on a computer in your, your business, your DSO, what damage can I do from that one computer? And that internal penetration test replicates that type of event, a very powerful event. Um, we often will limit that to say the DSO's headquarters or key executives that have kind of the, the keys to the kingdom. Um, doing a pen test at every single DSO location is not cost effective. But that, that's, that's the cadence. That training is another very effective methodology from, from a cyber risk uh, mitigation perspective. Your employees have to be trained uh, under law once per year. But we know that ongoing training is, is the most effective. But you have to empower your executives, especially your doctors and all of your team members on how to detect cyber threats through email, through the use of the Internet, like doing Google searches, things like that. We've had DSOs that have been victimized by cyber attacks because someone Googled QuickBooks and downloaded a malicious version that allowed hackers to get in or Googled HP tech support. We did a medical group where one of the doctors did that and allowed the hackers just to remote into the machine. And then the next day they walked into a ransomware attack. So all this type of training is, is so critical. And actually from a, from a legal and compliance perspective, you, you have to do it. There's not a choice, right? You, you have an incident and it was determined through root cause and forensics that someone clicked on a malicious link and then, Office for Civil Rights does an investigation, determines that person was never trained. That's going to put the executive team in a world of hurt. You know, they're going to own that that you know compliance issue and, and potential legal issue. Right. And I appreciate some of the specific examples, Gary, you, you've shared. And I guess before we move to some closing thoughts from each of you, I want to open it up. Are there any other specific examples or lessons learned you want to call out for folks? So open this up to the panel. Um, well, I, I call I out for, for attendees. Something that you know, I think is important for everybody to understand is the repercussions of this, you know, exactly what we're talking about that could occur. And, you know, we got a lot of examples around all this, but, you know, first of all, if one of these attacks happens, you have an acute loss of EBITDA and in the best of circumstances, that's two to three weeks. Everything goes right. If a couple things go wrong, it could be a couple months, three months easy, and you lose that type of EBITDA, uh, which is just horrible for an organization. Second, um, you'll have long-term loss, not just an acute loss, because some patients will be frustrated. If they can't come, if the office is shut down, they're not going to come back. They're going to make an appointment with somebody else. And assuming that that office can satisfy their needs, they might just keep coming back to that office and they're not going to come to your office 
this anymore. So you have an acute loss of EBITDA, a long-term loss of EBITDA. Number three, if they compromise your patient data and it gets breached, you have a HIPAA violation. So more than likely, uh, you're going to have to pay some fines and other expenses to notify everybody and mitigate that. If the government feels like you were reckless and didn't take security seriously, they can tack on a whole bunch of fines and penalties and you know other things. Number four, if you're a big DSO, you know if you're one or two offices, probably not you know a, a target for this. But if you're a DSO with dozens and dozens of offices, you're a nice target for a class action lawsuit. And the plaintiffs bar loves this stuff. And, and you're going to have to announce. I mean, you're going to tell the whole world. You're going to have to send letters to all your patients, telling them that there was a data breach and addressing it. And if you pay a fine to the government, that's going to be public. And now that's announced to the plaintiffs bar that you know you violated privacy regulations and other things. So now you're going to get a class action lawsuit if you're big enough and you're going to have to deal with that and settle that and uh, pay funds there. Three or, or four or five, whatever I'm on now, I lost track of how many problems I'm articulating. You, you know, if you're trying to uh, do an equity event, this is going to be a black mark, like we said on your record. If an equity event is imminent, it may stall, suspend, or cancel the process. So, for a whole bunch of you know cascade of dominoes here, all bad. You really don't want to do. You really don't want to have one of these problems. Yeah. And to your point from, from earlier, it's, it's just best not to get the flesh eating bacteria. It's yeah. just that's that's the better way to go. Um, I appreciate you laying that out, Brian, sort of a, a comprehensive, comprehensive overview of those repercussions um, and the specific learnings each of you have, have shared today. I want to give you some space as we come to the close uh, of our time together, just some space for some some closing thoughts. Anything you want attendees out there to 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 take away from this conversation, um, anything you want to reemphasize, something you didn't get to share, I leave it to you. Um, yes. Michael, I'm going to throw it to you first to get things going here. Yeah, sure. And I think I think Brian really, Kaleo really hit it home on his answer. I think my, my advice or my sort of closing remark would be, you need someone to call when these types of things happen. And you want to call them before it happens so that you're ready when it does happen. And Usually that that's going to be a third party. This is, as we said, this this is high level. These are threat occurrences. These are again, IT teams are important to what Brian said, but these aren't their special specialization. Ransomware isn't their specialization. Cyber attacks aren't their specialization. So you want to have the the right person to call. And and I think you know, especially given some of the things we said about EBITDA and enterprise value, it's it's not a huge investment. I think it's a worthy investment. I think you get tremendous amount of ROI on something like this to have the right person to call, to have the right party to call, to have the right items in place. And then the other one, and, and we, we're already practicing this at our organization, and, and I hope DSOs can do it. Um, you definitely want to run as many simulations as you can possibly run. This will happen. It's not a it's not an if, it's, it's more of a when. Um, this will happen. So you want to run simulations to know what to do when this occurs and, and be prepared. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Gary, turning it to you now. I think one of the best quotes I heard a CEO of a DSO say to me, she said, who's watching the watcher? And the reason she said this to me was because she was the victim of a ransomware attack that we actually dealt with. And they had actually met with us the year before and she was all sold like, hey, I, I need someone to watch my watch. And when she started questioning her uh, internal external IT resources, they assured her over and over again, and that everything was fine, and they, you know, had the place locked down. And fast forward to a year later, they got hit with a ransomware event. It was one of the nastiest events we've ever worked. Six weeks, all of their locations completely down. And guess what? They were 100% cloud-based. And said, I'm going to say the same thing that Brian says. I'm a, I'm a fan of cloud. I'm not shooting it down. The hackers were able to gain access to the entire cloud infrastructure of their imaging and practice management software in a matter of minutes. The way they did that was through a screen sharing app, right? They deployed a screen sharing app and used it to leverage an administrator's information, logged right in, learned how to use the software after a couple of minutes. And we saw this all through a forensics investigation and chose file export. And they exported 15,000 pages of patient records. All right. So 500,000 patient records impacted overall. This event was a $10 million event for a 15 location DSO. All right. The ransom demand alone was 2.5 million. They had $5 million worth of insurance. They had, a they had a tap lines of credit, 
doctors had to chip money in, right, to, to deal with this event. This is no joke what's going on right now. I think we talked a lot of, about some scary stuff, but I also believe that with proper preventative measures, you can really do a, a, a strong job at preventing intrusions into your environment. Right. Security is not a piece of software or a piece of hardware you throw on your network or in your environment. It's a multi-layered, multifaceted approach that has to be used by any size DSO. And one of the bigger problems that I see actually is as DSOs grow, these problems explode quickly, right? Because what happens is they're trying to build security on a foundation with one wall. And then all of a sudden, you know, 10 things start to crumble a little bit. Then they get to 20, 50, 100, and literally it just falls apart. I see this happen very frequently at the, in the DSO space. The, 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 they haven't built the four walls, the foundation to support their organization. And then a cyber event finds its way in and everything that Michael and Brian says, I've seen firsthand. So, um, we just had an issue you know, recently where one of our DSO clients was about to close on a multi-location DSO group. And within hours of that DSO group having an event, they called us They're like, hey, what do you know about this ransomware attack against this, you know, uh, oral surgery group? They they know, right? They have a reportable event now and they, they, they slowed the deal down specifically because of this type of event. So I'm 100% I'm supportive of everything that's been said here today. So this isn't yeah. just medical stuff. Gary, I appreciate the the specific examples that, that you brought to the table today. Thank you. Brian, final final thoughts from you. Don't bring a knife to a gunfight. That's the final thought on this whole thing. And, you know, your IT department is critical. Again, I don't want anybody to think we're putting down your IT department. They're critical to the day-to-day -day operation of your organization. You need to have them. And they do a great job, probably, in general, of, you know, upkeep and maintaining your network and doing your organization. This is not that. You need experts and specialists that are keeping up with every latest trend to compromise the security of your network. And you got to level the playing field. You got to get an outside consultant involved to do a risk assessment. And then you got to look at your insurance too. You know, we didn't talk about this, Brian, but insurance used to be readily available. And the issue was, hey, make sure you have enough insurance. Don't go with just the standard amount, you know, get enough of it. Now the insurance companies, just like with hurricanes and tornadoes and hail and floods, if you're in a high risk environment, they won't insure you. For the last couple of years, they've been insuring enough of this. And now they're like, no, if you don't meet certain requirements or don't do certain things that are best practices from a security standpoint, you're not going to be able to get insurance. And that would be the ultimate you know, tragedy in all this. If you get one of these attacks and you're underinsured and you have to, like Gary said, the doctors have to start chipping in. They got to go into their savings account and pull money you know, to pay for this. You don't want to do it because this is extremely expensive. So the way you level the playing field, so you don't got a knife and they don't got a machine gun is you get experts involved that specialize in this type of thing. And I know I'm a broken record, but I see this when I stop seeing it like every week, I guess I can stop going on here and ranting and raving. But as, as long as I keep getting at least one phone call, you know, a week to 10 days, I guess I got to go on here like some type of Brian raving lunatic and keep talking about this. But you got to get an outside third party involved and do a risk assessment. That's the only way you can rest easy. You've got to assess your insurance, make sure you're doing all the best practices and you have enough insurance in place so that you're prepared, so that you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Well, raving Brian's are welcome here, sir. So uh, I appreciate the, appreciate the time today. And also that call out on the insurance piece too. That's an important component that I, I, I'm happy we, we got to before we closed out. But Brian, appreciate the time. Gary as well. Michael, thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. And I also, of course, want to thank Rectangle Health for sponsoring today's webinar. To learn more about the discussion we had today, please check out the resources section on your webinar console and do fill out the webinar survey. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.